So I'm curious about, I guess, what compelled you to start this project. I know you talked about our first interview, and I am sure that this just was one of, I'm sure there's many things that led you to this, but I, I think what we talked about maybe before, we talked a little bit about this before we started recording, which is that we can talk about it in a general, a generalizing sense. Um, but this is a personal thing too, because we're both men. And uh, I, I think I may have said this as well, that for me, my coming to terms with maybe how I, who I am and that I am a man um, is in within a context of a time in which questions around gender and gender expression is like a really big thing. And I think it's absolutely necessary to have those conversations. So, you know, I, I think also like whether you're born, let's say you're born queer or you're born trans and you have these, um, this the, trying to live in a society such as ours is very difficult. So coming to terms with that is a whole process. But I also think if you're heteronormative or cisgender, there's also a process of coming to terms what that means for you as well. It may not be as rife with like threats of violence, of course, or any of those types of things that uh, people who are who are not cisgendered or heteronormative would experience. But there is this like real sense of like, you know, I have to be a certain way and there's a certain category or box that I have to fit into. And uh, my own personal experiences with coming to terms with masculinity or my own masculinity or or manhood or whatever has been like that, like feeling that I've had an aversion towards it and not really taking responsibility for it. Because to me, I've associated men most of my life as being what we would call, you know, the bad story of toxic masculinity. Like I've, I have not seen very many good examples in my life of like what it means to be a man in the most embodied, fullest sense of that. And so I wonder how much of this work you do exploring masculinity and what it means to be a man in that sense is tied to your maybe quest to figure that out for yourself. Like, um, you know, with all of these questions around, you know, what is, what is gender and how is gender expressed in all of these subjects? I think that needs to be directed towards men in a certain way, because like we're here we're not going to go away and we're, we need to have these like kind of conversations as well. I don't know if these make questions make any sense in yeah. any comprehensive way. Cause it's kind of, <laughs> I think I mentioned before we started, I'm in a pretty like weird emotional place at this exact moment. But anyway, I, these are a lot of thoughts I've been having and I'm trying to yeah. spill them onto you and hope may, hopefully they make some kind of sense to you. So I guess in your own personal journey, how has this like project of yours helped you like come to terms with some of these mm -hmm. questions or subjects? I sort of, threw at you there yeah 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 you know i'm i'm thinking now of a conversation i had with a, a author um i think he's a professor as well in san francisco his name is alan chinnan and he wrote a book called beyond the hero which came out after iron john uh, mm -hmm. a few years after uh bly i believe robert bly who wrote iron john or he wrote the book iron john um he he, he was supported with the manuscript there as well so in some ways it was like a lineage continuity from from Iron John, which those who've read the book know that it is largely a, a story about initiation from boy to manhood. Uh, and when was sort of foundational in the, the text that kicked off the first wave mythopoetic men's movement. And of course, another major one was um, King War, Magician Lover. Uh, so Beyond the Hero, which is very, a lot less known, and I, I somebody recommended it, I think a listener, I posted it and I, I found it and I was like, wow, this is really incredible. Because what it does is it looks at the journey after. So from more like midlife of, of sort of masculine stories. And one thing he talks about there as well is this uh, sequence that men actually go through um, or seem to seem to go through, which is um, this, they start uh, sort of as boys and, and there's a sort of adolescent masculinity, right? Like um, if we're talking uh, again, a culture, and this is again, as soon as you talk about masculinity or femininity or masculine feminine, I mean, I should say all of this, just before I get to the beyond the hero, all of all of this inquiry is happening in the wake of something that has already happened. <laughs> and maybe that's one way to say it, right? And and that happening is is like Stephen Jenkinson would say, and you know, it's like uh, uh, putting up your tent, you know, in in a valley, um, not realizing that it's actually a crater, 
Mm, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's, I feel, what all, so much of these conversations are actually about. They're actually happening in a crater of something that's already happened. And what's the happening, you know, that I've also been able to tra- track. I mean, more broadly, just say the, just the utter wake of, I mean, colonization, calamity, displacement, right? And essentially like a, a total uh, tribal breakdown. And, and when I say tribal in this case, I mean, not how it's used often in modern day contexts is a kind of tribalism, right? Which is a sort of uh, only adhering to a certain identity group, I think. Mm-hmm. Whereas I mean tribe in the sense of like distinct peoples. And, you know, I, a conversation I have with indigenous folk who still have connection and lived reality with their intact lineages, you know, they often just say, well, well, this is, you know, this is what our people do, you know, about whatever we happen to be talking about. Well, this is what our people do. Uh, they rarely seem to say to me, you know, everyone should do this, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone should be doing what we do. Because th- there's a particular kind of humility, but also a knowing who they are, I think, that comes with when one understands oneself to be part of a discernible people and connected to a place. And so that's what I'm trying to say is like, you know, we're kind of in the wake of uh, a sort of the, the suffering and the uh, pain of, of living under some kind of universal, right? Mm-hmm. Which one could say that the, the sort of distinct binary that um, those who grew up in modern culture are sort of forced into, and, and often the term comes out of uh, that this is patriarchy, like a sort of distinct and, and enforced binary of, you know, these types of behaviors are okay for men, these ones aren't, right. and for women it's this. And of course, queer and non-binary have a very hard time because they don't fit in that picture. They're, they're actually sort of erased from that picture, sometimes, you know, or often by force. Yeah. And so if that's, that's, the, that's the crater, I guess I'm trying to say. So what, what is helpful to know, I think, is that the, the natural response to a, a sort of, um, I don't know, violent, suppressive universal can be often to try to create another universal. Mm. Right, which which makes sense because it's like, oh well, this isn't working. This universal, so we need a different universal that is more inclusive. Uh, that is, you know, and it, what it sounds like, I think, often is, you know, you you can be whatever you want to be, right? Like if that's the triumph. Often is like, well, you can just, you know, there was some video I saw a little while ago by I think it was uh, a young person who was I think coming out as non-binary, um, and their their sort of triumphal statement was sort of, you can decide who whoever you want to be. Uh, and yeah. in some ways, it does sound like a victory, you know, to the in the face of a system that would tell you to be a certain way, right? And yet, there's something else I think there below, which is almost like it's still a triumph of this individual uh, sense of oneself as supreme, right? Yeah. Which, uh, when you talk to other, again, peoples that have a certain deeper communal collective uh, understanding of the world and an interdependent understanding of the world. You know, they don't necessarily consider the supremacy of the self as some kind of triumph, right? They actually see that that's, there's a deep loss there when you don't see yourself as a deeply relational being who actually relies on the feedback of others, like the loving feedback and, you know, the, the mentors and the elders to track you and to like name your medicine and, you know, all that kind of stuff I feel gets lost when, you know, the victory is I decide who I am and, you know, you know anybody else doesn't matter. Um, so I just I'll say that to then get back to now, so beyond the hero. So what he talks about is then that men have this journey that they seem to take, which is that they start with, you know, as an adolescent, uh, sort of adolescent masculinity. And then they have this, uh, f- he calls it the fear and fascination of the feminine, right? Which I love that phrasing, the fear and the fascination. Because again, it's this like, oh, it's not me. It's this other, this mysterious other. And of course, when puberty kicks in and often if there is this, uh, heterosexual orientation, of course, then there is this mysterious draw and, and attraction. And then also, yeah, this fascination and this fear. And he says it's really important as this then uh, exploration into the feminine, which for me, when I track in my story, I think that's absolutely true, right? Like I, uh, this whole journey I, I spent for about four, well, maybe six years, I think total, uh, exploring Amplify Her, Right, which is the project that ended up being really a, a look at the rise of the feminine uh, through the lives of artists, DJs, and producers, female DJs and producers, um, of which I was a co-director on the project. And for me, th- that was also my immersion into feminine archetypes and you know, reading Marion Woodman, women who, dance with, uh, women who Run With Wolves, um, Dancing in the Flames, looking at a lot of gender theory and all this. 
that does not make me an expert at all. It just means that, yeah, I, I tried to really understand as much as I could. Um, and from that experience, I then reve- re- revealed the depth of what I didn't know about masculinity. And then that became my journey into, oh, I found Iron John, my grandfather's study quite auspiciously and uh, launched you know, in, into my own sort of like, oh, wow, why hadn't I looked at this before, right? Which again is part of that veil of... Uh, of like being unable to really see oneself from that lens that has permeated the culture and you know less so now depending on who you talk to that this kind of mythic lens has been uh reignited right so it feels uh, more accessible i think for men now uh, particularly you know when they're ready Bly says usually around 30 35 is when they kind of have a you know their their best intent you know in their 20s onward seems to have turned to ash and, you know, and they they ask questions then again of like, whoa, who am I actually, you know, and, you know, what is authentic and all that stuff. And so, you know, there's a certain mysterious timing to things. So I'll just say that, yeah, that this fascination and fear of the feminine. And then on the other side of that, I'll just end with this. He just says, then there's this uh, inquiry or contact made, what's what he calls the deep masculine, which is, again, a whole other territory, which is really great to go down if you want to get there. But maybe I'll just pause and... Uh, yeah, let's see what you think. Yeah, well, you know, I think I, I just want to say like the this progression you're talking about, I, I just resonated with it because what I thought I knew in my 20s is just totally fucking disintegrated <laughs> to the point where it's really, it's 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 upsetting. It's been an upsetting thing because it's, it's, like, a, it's like learning that everything I thought I knew about myself isn't really as solid as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. And um, there's just a lot of threads there that I almost want to follow. I'm trying to think of where to go with this right now. Mm. Um, Bly calls that the road of ashes, by the way. Okay. Or the the yeah. descent to ashes. Yeah. Which is that kitchen okay. work. He calls it when you, when you're basically sifting through the ashes of, you know, your good intentions and ideas of yourself, but as necessary work. Yeah. There's, and there is that thing. And I, and I had to, a certain aspect of growing up or a certain maturity which is good intentions are fine but like that doesn't change your behavior the behaviors of your past or your present and how that's impacted people you care about and how that's affected relationships Mm. and there's like a real like real hard thing there it's a really deep pain and that's the thing i've been like grappling with over the past few years is this like not sure where to go or how to proceed anymore with this because it's really easy to see all the things wrong with men today. I see it everywhere I go. I see it in myself. And um, it feels like there's just a giant hole there, Mm. this like void that never got attended to or acknowledged for so long. And now I'm in my 30s. I'm 32 right now. And it's like anyone who's gotten close enough to me has seen that void. And then they don't know what to do with that. And I don't know what to do with it either. So it's like, and I know that that's tied to being a man in some way. I know it has something to do with that. And so this place I'm in currently is is acknowledgement of that. And so this whole journey of, of men, so to speak, it seems to be tied to that. And it's like health, a real culture, healthy culture seems to acknowledge that thing that boys or men need in order to grapple with that thing inside of them. That just seems to be what it feels to me. And I'm like, and this is the fear I have this like horrifying fear, which is that, is it too late? Like, is it too late for me? Is it too late for others? Mm what do I do with this thing? I mean, is it just going to eat everything up that I care about, you know, and the thing that I want the most, you know, will I never attain that thing, you know? So it's, it's this, this journey you're talking about is really like connecting with me. I just, I don't know if you've related with that feeling at all. Could you Um, describe it a little more too? Like you said, this void and now do you mean like a sort of uh, existential angst or, or sort of a blanket of depression or, you know, is there yeah, sure. It's it? kind of all of those things. Sometimes it's a, um, it can come at, it's, it's a, uh, I think it's honestly, it's a, there's a bit of a trauma there. 
So a lacking of something in my childhood. It's not about blame. I'm not, I'm past the point of blaming anybody for this. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of like lacking something, not having men in my life, for instance, like I've had a lot of nurturing women. That's been no issue. I've had a lot of nurturing women and beautiful human beings, not just nurturing women, other nurturing men too, but just nurturing people. Mm. But then the, the other side of that has been wholly lacking. I think in many cases, I've seen more than anything disappointment from men. They've fallen short in like every way that's meaningful, except in like, oh, I can pay for things or I can like take care of like material needs and that's mm. it. Mm -hmm. And that spawned this like complex and it's led to this confused confusion about my relationship with myself and my own gender and my own expression of ma masculinity or, or being a man. And then also my confusion around how to be in like intimate relationship with people. Like that's the whole, the whole is like, I will never have enough because I can't get, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it any other way. And it manifests in all kinds of dysfunctional behaviors, um, addictive patterns and so on, mm. which I'm currently trying to like, like deal with per mm -hmm. personally speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that answer it at all? Oh, yeah, I so, think so. You know, I it mean, can, it can manifest as depression for sure. Just yeah. a blanket of like, I don't know what to do anymore with my life. And I don't know if there's any point of going on. Like that's the worst end of it, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I I mean, what comes to me is just a, I mean, uh, I think what Martin Schaffer said this, but he was, I think he was quoting Rumi, but he said, uh, you know, when you haven't become, when you haven't been fed, become bread. Hmm. And there's something in that with, like you said, like, how do you turn what you never got into something, right? And and in that sense, there's the invitation there, which is which is formidable, you know, to to traverse the gap of which properly in a, and by that sort of birthright would have come to you the presence of men in your life in that certain way those that would have gathered you in at a certain age generally around 13 14 right taking you out to the wild or somewhere where you can have an encounter with the great mystery um which you know i'm in i'm currently in a four-year cycle of which i'm in the last one and so i have some time in with this and again, it doesn't make me an expert at all. It just means like I have a little bit of experiential um, sense of what that is to be essentially like properly and and sort of compassionately, but firmly uh, brought to the the end of you, hmm. right? And in some sense, it is a kind of trauma. It certainly would be probably to that age, like 13, 14. Whereas later in life, when people participate in these things like wilderness vigils and things, you know, you can certainly go through a lot. Um, but it, it, it doesn't have perhaps generally that same sense of utter world endingness um, that that perhaps a youth would have, right? When when, be, when they really are like, what is happening? I don't, you know, yeah. I, I can't put this together. So it's, it is in some sense, it's like meaningful trauma mm. uh, in, in that it's something that is traumatizing to basically be brought to the edge of you. Um, but in a village context where people properly would have helped you make meaning of that, right? And would have said, this is what it's, you know, inviting you into a bigger story that you're not the center of the universe. And yeah. thank goodness you're not the center of the universe, actually, right? That, yeah, that, right. You, but you're part of it. You're part of that story. And then you would have been welcomed in likely into some, you know, way of, of meaningful service to both the, you know, the community and to life itself. And so in some sense, like, you know, you're, I think you're speaking truly, you're, you're testifying to this existential void, which is the, it is intelligent and then it points to something that's not there. Right. And so, mm -hmm. like you said, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ways in which the, the coping strategies kick in. And yeah, certainly for me too, oftentimes it's like busyness. It's like stay mm -hmm. busy, right. For a lot of people that is, that's another way of, of kind of keeping it, you know, at bay. Um, and I have to say that, yeah, there's no way around it in the sense that, you actually have to go into it, I, I think. And, but I'm drawing from other modalities like, um, you know, Stephen Jenkinson said too one time that uh, depression is what happens when grief isn't allowed in the room. Hmm. Right. That, that actually depression uh, and actually drawing from another uh, fellow I interviewed, uh, Clinton Callahan, he talks about depression as the mix of uh, anger and sadness that actually those two, and it's almost like the, they're stuck both trying to get out the door at the same time. And so in that mixing, 
they they become almost this uh, debilitating uh, yeah. f- emotion or a debilitating force, right? Whereas, like Clinton, he advocates for demixing emotions, where right? he's like, I physically, you know, kind of do this like, uh, and like pull them <laughs> apart, and then you can go fully into the anger, right? Hopefully, and there's like practices that he offers, and then you can go fully into the sadness, and then like it moves, and they're not like stuck in the doorway still. So, yeah, I guess I, I want to depathologize a little bit. I think of what you're speaking to because. I mean, it's, it's true in that, like, yeah, there's a lot that wasn't there that should have been. There's a lot of grief in that and a lot of anger in that, that it wasn't the case. And that on the other side of that, hopefully, is this willingness to say, okay, well, if I didn't get it, what's needed to plant the seeds for the generations to come? 